Well, we've learned uh, several things about the Earth. Um, we know that it's an oblate spheroid. Uh, we know that you weigh more at the North Pole or the South Pole than you do at the equator. Um, we uh, know that spherically symmetric objects gravitate as though all their mass is concentrated at the uh, center. And we know that if you increase your elevation above the surface of the Earth, you decrease your weight. <clears throat> We've also mentioned that if there are no subsurface density contrasts, there are no local gravity anomalies. The anomalies that we've talked about are associated with the uh, shape of the Earth, um, elevation relative to the center of the Earth, and um, so on. Uh, so, basically we'd be out of a job. There wouldn't be any puzzle to solve. Uh, if the inner core, the outer core, uh, the mantle were all homogeneous, um, then there wouldn't be any, if, if we ran our survey from one end to the other, uh, there would be no anomalies for us to ponder and resolve. <clears throat> However, um, just look around and you can see that this really isn't the case. You can see mountains, valleys, synclines, anticlines, and perhaps a landfill here and there. Uh, <clears throat> these features, um, the geological features or these engineered um, features that we might not know too much about and that we want to learn more about, for instance, how deep is the landfill? Uh, if it was put in there a long, long time ago, we don't, uh, we don't really know. That could be a problem we might want to address. So we might run a gravity survey across uh, the landfill to find out how thick it is, what the uh, underlying topography looks like. Um, <clears throat> how does the acceleration due to gravity vary from one point to another across the landfill? Well, we expect that it's going to be less over the landfill if the density of the landfill material is less than that of the bedrock, which, you know, in most cases, it, that would be the case. So, we, we know that uh, elevation, for example, is a non-geological influence on your observations, on the observations of the acceleration due to gravity. It really has nothing at all to do with, um, you know, subsurface geology, but we also learned that um, the these changes can be larger than the geological, than the anomalies produced by geological features that we're interested in. We saw that in the case of the uh, karst feature that we talked about. So we did set this up previously. We said, uh, okay, well, uh, in order to <clears throat> remove the influence of elevation, we have to know how much those changes contribute. So we calculate the derivative of the uh, <clears throat> acceleration, and we found that that is equal to minus g times the mass of the Earth uh, over r sub e, uh, the radius of the Earth squared. So one of the things to think about would be, can you solve this expression over here, dg dr? Uh, so it doesn't require knowing the mass of the Earth. Uh, what if we didn't know what m sub e was? Could we figure out what dg dr is? <clears throat> you know, from from um, surveys and so on, we can figure out what the radius of the Earth is. So that, you know, that would likely be a known quantity. Um, so DGR, DG dr is a function of uh, g and r is, is what we want to get. So we just come back to this expression and we notice that embedded in this expression here, we actually have uh, we have g. Uh, the expression for uh, g is embedded in the above equation, and we can just pull it out. So we have minus 2 over r ti times uh, the gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth over r sub b squared. And I've dropped the subscript here, but this is going to turn out to be just minus 2g over r. And with a radius of, uh, an average radius of about uh, uh, 6,370,000 meters, 
Can you make an estimate of DGDR? Well, if you did, you'd find that it would be point about approximately 0 0.3077 times 10 to the minus fifth second, uh, inverse second squared. So if we want to calculate dg, the change in the acceleration due to gravity with a change in elevation dr of one meter, we would be multiplying this by one meter. So this would give us meters per second squared. And that would give us 0 0.3077 times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second squared. Remember that this 10 to the minus fifth meters per second squared is a milligal. So this would be about one-third of a milligal. <clears throat> Pretty small change, but it adds up. If you're uh, walking up and down the hills running your survey, um, the value of G that you measure here could be considerably different than the value of G that you measure here. Have absolutely nothing at all to do with the uh, uh, subsurface geology. Uh, another problem that we have is that, well, we really aren't taking measurements of the acceleration due to gravity up in a hot air balloon somewhere. We have something underneath our feet that we're walking on. And <clears throat> assuming that there isn't a, a major geological problem here, we're, this is a feature that we're going to have to, that we're also going to have to uh, eliminate or compensate for. And that would be the uh, matter between the observation point and some reference um, datum, uh, most often sea level. Doesn't have to be sea level. Question would be how do you compensate for the topography beneath your observation point? This is something that we'll get into in more detail later on, but we're just kind of cataloging, cataloging some of the, the effects uh, that we have to uh, correct for. Uh, we've already talked about um, we already talked about these before. We know that we have, um, you know, we know that uh, depending on your latitude, your acceleration due to gravity is going to vary. You're going you're to weigh more. The uh, acceleration due to gravity is going to increase from about 9.78 at the equator to 9.83 or so at the uh, poles. And then we also have this centrifugal acceleration. <clears throat> so your your velocity is about 463 meters per second. And um, if the Earth suddenly disappeared and you were tethered to the center of the Earth, you would go flying off at that velocity. And at that velocity, you could hit the moon in about two days. Um, so um, 463 meters per second, 1,000 miles per hour, uh, something like that, anyway. Um, <clears throat> Also, some other uh, influences that you should lose sight of. Um, the, the Those of the sun and the moon. We have these big objects up in the sky. And uh, they're pretty far away, but they do influence the observations of the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth's surface. So we need to compensate for solar and lunar tides. There, there are also issues uh, with mechanical instrumentation where you have some drift or some permanent elongation of the spring over time. And one attempts to minimize this by uh, pinning it when it's not in use and, and so on. But it's another effect that you usually have to estimate and compensate for. <clears throat> all, it's important to compensate for all these things because if we don't, these are the kinds of anomalies that we're going to see in our data that really have nothing at all to do with the subsurface geology. And we don't want to misinterpret uh, uh, these kinds of influences as geology. So this is pretty important. It's, it's pretty important for us to be able to predict what these um, effects are and to uh, eliminate them. So we've talked about several, several effects. and. Um, uh, what we'd like to do, ideally, would be to, at any particular point, you know, in your backyard, uh, what is the acceleration due to gravity, you know, assuming that you knew nothing at all about the subsurface geology and its influence, uh, 
you could predict what's referred to as the normal gravity, which would be the gravitational acceleration on the reference ellipsoid. This would incorporate the change of g with, uh, with latitude. We also have this hot air balloon effect, you know, what's referred to as the free air effect. And uh, this is just due to the changes in elevation. Uh, when we talked about the effects of the material beneath your feet, there are two terms associated with that that we'll talk about more later on. One of them is referred to as the Bouguer plate effect, and the other is just the terrain effect. And then we also mentioned this uh, term in here, tide and drift, the effects of tide and drift, and they're, they're often combined. So these different terms can be combined into an expression which is equivalent to a prediction of what the acceleration should be in your backyard or at any point along the transect that you're surveying in. And if the Earth is homogeneous, your observation will match your prediction. But this is rarely the case because there are other very interesting things going on in the subsurface. Uh, another thing that we'll be talking about, another quantity that we'll be talking about when we get into to the analysis of gravity data will be the gravity anomaly. Well, this, this is really, this is basically the heart of um, of just about everything that we do with um, with with gravity. This is where the interesting part of our work lies is in this remainder. We make an observation. We made that prediction. We estimated all these terms. We came up with a predicted or a theoretical uh, uh, estimate of the gravitational field. We end up with some anomaly. In other words, this theoretical or predicted value doesn't match the observation. There's an anomaly, and that anomaly is related to subsurface geology. And that, that's where all that's where we have a lot of, we have a lot of fun with that. That's where the fun begins, and um, so we often you know end up using computers to model the data. We have ideas about what's going on in the subsurface. We have maybe some well control, uh, some seismic data, you know, very, various uh, constraints that we can incorporate in our models to help explain what this gravity anomaly is associated with. And uh, the theoretical or predicted gravity then, just to kind of come back and summarize, we can put this into uh, an expression that looks like this. This would be the theoretical gravity. Here's the normal gravity. Remember that the elevation influences are negative if we increase uh, our elevation. We have a negative sign in here because it reduces the acceleration due to gravity. Uh, the effects of topography and uh, terrain combined here with the plate term and the uh, topographic term. Um, plus sign for the plate because you have additional mass beneath your feet, a minus sign for the topography because uh, grooves in the surface uh, reduce the acceleration due to measured acceleration due to gravity, as do mountains above you. Uh, they basically pull the spring up as well. And then we have uh, tide and drift. So, if uh, if these theoretical and observed gravity match, then you might assume that there's no geology, no lateral heterogeneity. Uh, and, and again, the geology would be fairly uninteresting, perhaps just a layer cake. So we'll, we'll spend more time uh, with these ideas, but um, uh, before we get, before we get in, into this, we'll, we'll develop a little better understanding of the individual terms in the above equations. And so go to your text, whatever text that you're using, look over these um, corrections, and um, uh, we'll talk about the Bouguer plate, the topographic correction, and uh, um, in a little bit more, more detail in the uh, uh, next, uh, next video. So see you then.